All right, church. Hey, man, glad you're here. You look good and you sound great. Hey, raise your hand if you uh, remember what that uh, instrument was there in the video called a slide projector. Anybody remember? All right. Good, good, good. Some are probably like, what is that foreign modern technology that we're using there? So, hey, buy, take your Bibles, Bible app, First Kings. If you're not sure where First Kings is, start at the very start and go 11 books uh, forward and, we, and you will find uh, First Kings. Okay, so let me give you a couple things. First of all, good morning to the Biltmore Church family. I uh, mean, wherever you are, we're distributed all across the 828. So, so glad you are at church this morning. Hope you had a fantastic week. Uh, we did. Let me give you a couple things. First of all, big thank you uh, to Everybody who yesterday, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers yesterday uh, spanned out over 40 schools in five different counties uh, for Billmore Church Love Schools. Thank you so much. We talk a ton about demonstrating the gospel and declaring the gospel. And what you did yesterday is you probably did both, but I, you definitely demonstrated the gospel. You served our communities because Jesus served us. So thank you so much for that. I know we're closing in somewhere about a thousand backpacks for students in need and uh, online line is already closed out for that, but if you are at whatever campus you're at, if you want to put it in uh, in one of those boxes today, that would be awesome. I think they're being actually distributed this Wednesday, and so maybe even you might have a couple more days if you forgot for that. And then uh, secondly, at every single location, this Wednesday is Starting Point. If you haven't been to a Starting Point, please sign up for that. It's free. Child care's there. It's a way for you to kind of figure out, how do I connect into this thing? How do, what's, what are you all about? Where are you going? What's the deal with, with my family? How do we do all of that? That is where you do that. You can sign up again in the lobby. You can sign up online uh, for that. So here's an email uh, or actually a story I heard in staff meeting on Sunday. And this is from, uh, this is an email from one of our rising juniors in, uh, in the student ministry. His name is David. And so th- I'm just going to read it, but I want you to em- emphasize a couple of different things in this email, because what it shows us, what it shows us is both uh, the imperative to pray, but also the struggle about praying. It shows us that how essential prayer is, but it also shows us the fact that oftentimes we struggle a little bit when it comes to this whole thing about prayer. So here's what he said. David said uh, this. He said, I was so encouraged to invite my one to Wake Weekend, someone who is close to me, but he's far from God. I invited my friend to Wake Weekend and he eventually said, yes. He said, I got so pumped and I began praying like crazy asking God over and over to do what he does best and to save my friend Dominic. I prayed that God would make him more receptive to the gospel. Eventually, Wake Weekend happened, and even though I was praying like crazy, I could not see God moving in his life. I was a little discouraged because I thought that God didn't hear my prayer, but I was wrong. A couple of months later, I found out the day before student camp that he was actually coming to student camp. Dominic was attentive in the sermons. He began opening up to some of the leaders. He said, you know what? I've not fully surrendered my life to Christ. And a couple of hours later in a dorm down in Anderson, South Carolina, our leader asked him if he wanted to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. And he said, yes, he got on his knees and he said, I led him in a prayer to surrender to Christ. And he said, I got to baptize him the following Sunday. And here's the way he ends his email. Even though I may have given up on praying for Dominic after wake weekend, God never stopped pursuing him. Even though I couldn't see God answering my prayer when I first prayed, I can look back and see that God was working all along, challenging Dominic. And he said, then at the end, he said, he did this. He said, now after I baptized Dominic, he said, I took my one bracelet and said, you were my one. And he said, he took his one bracelet and gave it to Dominic saying, now you go pray and find out your one. And I'm like, man, give a round of applause to a junior in high school who would simply understand that, you know what, we... We want to pray. We want to pray. And even when we can't see God working all the time, it doesn't mean God is not at work. And so uh, here's, again, what I'm saying, what I said at the start, is that is somewhat expressing the necessity as well as the struggle with prayer. Because you don't have to go too far in the Bible to see how prayer is absolutely integral. And if you go into the New Testament, how it was such an integral part of Jesus's life and how it was an integral part of the early church. And in many ways, it was the secret behind the explosion of the early church. Just a quick sampling in Acts chapter one, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Acts chapter two, they devoted themselves to prayer. Acts chapter four, they prayed for an outpouring of the spirit of God during their persecution. 
Acts chapter 6, it says the apostles devoted themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. In Acts chapter 9, Peter prays for the sick. In Acts chapter 12, the church prays for Peter to be released from prison. In Acts 13, they're praying when God raises up missionaries. In in, uh, 14, verse 23, they prayed and they appointed elders after they had prayed. Over and over and over again, they are always about praying. It was fundamental to what they did. And sometimes in church, what was fundamental to the early church is somewhat incidental, incidental with us. And the reason is the struggle that we often have is basically this, is sometimes, if we're honest, sometimes we pray and we see stuff happen Sometimes we don't pray and we see stuff happen. Sometimes we forget to pray about what we told somebody we would pray for to begin with and we see that happening. And so you can kind of come to the conclusion, you know what, do my prayers actually make a difference? And so over the next three weeks, kind of the rhythm of our church the last five or six years is before we kind of kick off the school year and kick off all of that, we enter into what's called 21 days of prayer. There's two things about 21 days of prayer I want you to realize. Number one, That's what it is. It's 21 days where we are going to try to take the most significant burden in your life. Most of the people at church today, you can identify one significant burden in your life. And we are going to pray about that for 21 days in a row. Most people have never prayed for one thing 21 days in a row, no days off. 21 days in a row, no whining, no worrying, no trying to fix it ourselves. For 21 days, we're gonna do the battle on our knees. And to come alongside you with that, we wanna give you some tools. And you'll see this online, you'll see this as many places as we can put it. If you want the resources, I would just text the text 21, just text 21 to 28282. You can go on the website and just go to builtmorechurch.com backslash 21 and here's what you'll get you'll get a daily prayer prompt and actually the prayers spelled out for you. Now you can elaborate from there, but it's for 21 days, you'll get a reminder, you'll get a sample, you'll get what to pray for. And if you have a family, like there's a whole family calendar there, there's a whole kids curriculum that's there on how do you pray with your kids? How do you pray with your family? All of that is there. So we wanna come alongside and help you. Because as I said, the vast majority of the people that I'm talking to right now or online, you have at least one significant burden. And it varies for sure. That burden might be your one, just like was in the email. You might have written somebody's name on the wall, you love them dearly, and right now you're not seeing anything that you can put your hands on that God is at work in their life. And what we'll see is most of Jesus' teaching on prayer had to do with persistence and not giving up. Some of you've got some marriages that are in the toilet and you know it, I know it. Some of our pastors know it and you know that you are at church probably if God doesn't do something in your marriage, every indication is that whole thing is over. One of you, if not both of you, you want to quit and marriage is the biggest thing and you can pray about that for 21 days. I'm gonna give you some samples in a minute. Maybe you got a prodigal. I sent an email out to just a small kind of subsection of our church saying, hey, over this next 21 days, you are kind of that group of people I wanna pray for. I wanna pray for and tell me if there's something specific. And I cannot tell you how overwhelming it is that the vast, not the vast majority, but by far the number one request was for prodigals. My prodigal daughter, my prodigal son, my prodigal teenager, they're far from God. They're hanging around with the wrong people. There's no interest in the things of God at all. So maybe it is your, your prodigal. Maybe it's a health situation. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a habitual situation, some habit that you know sooner or later, if you don't get some victory over that sin, over that habit, it is gonna destroy you and there will be some collateral damage to those that are around you. So today we start 21 days of prayer and we're gonna start it in 1 Kings 18. Now, if you are not new to Bible study, then a lot of attention is usually go to the first part of this story and it's one of the most incredible stories in the Bible. And people though sometimes get so distracted by the first part of the story, they don't pay attention to the back part of the story which actually deals with, with prayer. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you the first couple of verses, and then I'm going to do about a five-minute recap of where we are so you understand the context of what's going on. But 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 36, it says, And at the time of the offering of the oblation, just the kind of the normal offering time, 
Elijah the prophet, keep him in mind. Elijah's kind of our subject to some degree. It's his prayer life that we're going to look at today. Elijah the prophet came near, and here's, here's the first part of his prayer. Oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things. We'll talk about what those things are in a second. I've done all these things at your word. And in verse 37, you get a little bit of a sense of his desperation when he says, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Let's do a review. At this point in the nation of Israel, Israel's in a bad, bad spot spiritually. They are great violators. They are great apostatizers. At this point in time, they have repeatedly rejected God's overtures to them to come back to them. They now have two of the worst rulers in Israel's history by the name of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Israel is covered up in idolatry and false gods. The two preeminent ones, uh, one's called Baal and one is called Asherah, which is kind of like Baal's girlfriend. And Baal is actually not even one God. It's like a title of a conglomeration of gods. And so they had all these gods. They had the God of rain, the God of crops, the God of fertility, and all these gods they were sacrificing to. They were very, very wicked gods. They would require things like temple prostitution and child sacrifice. And Israel was starting to go into those same practices. So God sends Elijah. Elijah shows up out of nowhere in chapter 17. And he just says, and Elijah the Tishbite, that actually I've always thought that sounds fairly tough. I mean, Elijah is like the man's man. He's God's man. And he comes out on the scene, don't know about him until chapter 17. And he says, Ahab, it is not going to rain because of your wickedness, it is not going to rain for three and a half years. Now you're like, how does he know that? I'll come back to that. But in the book of Deuteronomy, God has said, when the apostasy reaches a certain level, I'm going to withhold rain from this agrarian community. So three years goes by and there's still no rain. And yet Israel is yet to return to God. And so a lot of the Attention of this chapter goes to a challenge that Elijah the prophet gives to the prophets of Baal. And there's 450 of these prophets of Baal and he gives them a challenge. He says, why don't you meet me on Mount Carmel and we're gonna have a challenge to see whose God is the real God. Whoever's God can actually call fire down from heaven, that is the real God. And the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them, like that sounds like a good idea. And so he allows the prophets of Baal to go first. And man, they get after it. I mean, they get after it. They pray and they pray. And at, the, at some point they had prayed for about a half a day and nothing has happened. They then go to extreme. They get desperate. They start to scream. They start to cut themselves. And then there's a verse in there and it simply says, and nothing happened and no one answered. And by the way, that is a phenomenal reminder to us that idols always overpromise and underdeliver. They always promise something on the front end that they cannot deliver on the back end. Our idols will always let us down. What an opposite, what an opposite picture of the gospel. Because what idols do and don't have what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. Chronological snobbery is here we are with all our advancements and when we hear the word idol, we think what a bunch of, what a bunch of buffoons those years ago that they would actually bow down to these carved wooden little statues. But understand, listen, we have our idols. All an idol is, is anything that we look to for joy and security and comfort that leaves God out. And so we definitely have our modern day idols. Our modern day idols are our portfolio, our Instagram followers, our respect from other people, how far we've climbed up the corporate ladder. It's anything that we have to say, I gotta have this to be happy. Without God, that is an idol. And what Baal says, Baal is saying, listen, I will provide. I provide the rain, I provide the fertility, I provide the kids, I provide the crops, I provide that. And yet, uh, again, what are ours? Ours are like, uh, uh, again, money, marriage, romance, 
But the thing about an idol is an idol, an idol always demands a sacrifice. So Baal is demanding a sacrifice, and that's where he got into this child sacrifice, and he got all that kind of stuff. And it's like, listen, if, if you fail me, I will curse you. What an opposite picture of the gospel. The gospel says when we fail God, Jesus takes the curse on himself. The gospel says, listen, he's not saying you sacrifice for right standing. He says, I sacrifice for you. I love the way that Keller puts it and says, you know what, Jesus is the only God that when you actually obtain him, when you actually get him, will actually satisfy you at the soul level, but when you fail him, he will forgive you. And so time is for Elijah, skipping on down in verse 27, it says, at noon, Elijah mocked them. This makes me feel pretty good about my sanctification process, because I'm like, okay, that guy did it too. And he began to mock the idols of the day. And here's what he says. He says, cry louder for he is God. Either, and here's what he, he starts to put the needle into the prophets. He's like, either he's musing, which is kind of like he's on Facebook, either he, meaning Baal, or he is relieving himself, which is exactly what you think it means. It means he's in the bathroom or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And so this prophet of God starts to mock the false prophet. It's like, listen, maybe he's, maybe he's busy online. Maybe he's on a trip to the Bahamas. Maybe he's just going to the bathroom and he is not answering you. So it is Elijah's time. And Elijah, before we get to our text, he's like, it's not even hard enough. You all built an altar. You tried to call fire down from heaven. And he demands the people pour all this water on the altar which is amazing because water is the most precious substance during a time of a drought. He's like, get all that somewhere between 350 and 700 gallons. They pour on this altar. In other words, it is soaking wet. So with that being said and that review, let me read 36 again. And let's, what I want to talk about is like, how do we get more power in our prayers? I want that. I want the next 21 days. I want to see some stuff happen in my life, in my family's life, in our church's life, I wanna see, so what do I need to do? What are some things that I need to adjust? At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. That's a great thing to tag on to every single one of our prayers. And that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you are Lord. That's his motive. That you are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Put down three or four different little jot, jot a few things down in your notes or on your phone. Number one, if we're going to pray more powerfully, it's going to start off because it's going to be prayers that are prayed desperately. I used to think lack of prayer was because of self-discipline. I thought, you know what? If I I can just get some more self-discipline, then I would pray more. I would have that meaningful prayer time every single day if I would just have a little bit more self-discipline. And what I realized a number of years ago, this is not about self-discipline. This is about desperation. You don't have to talk somebody who is desperate into praying. You don't have to talk the mom and dad who's, son is over there on a battlefield. You don't have to talk them into praying for their son when he's in harm's way. You don't have to talk somebody in when their loved one is on the operating table. You don't have to talk somebody into praying when their prodigal is far off. The reason is, is because they are desperate. And Elijah's got 450 to one. He's just dumped gallons of water onto an altar in the middle of a drought The people are like, what are you doing? You have created an impossible situation. And you might be at church today and you're like, hey, Bruce, I'm all all cool with these kind of Old Testament stories and some bearded prophet and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? You don't know the situation I'm in. My situation is impossible. And again, your situation might be marital. And you're like, you know what? We don't even talk to each other at the house. Last time we talked to each other was like four days ago and we're living in the same house. We just avoid each other. It's just a matter of clicking it off until we can run out the clock or until the kids go off to college before we can just kind of call this thing quits so we kind of limit the collateral damage. You don't know what an impossible situation is. You got a prodigal. 
and you have prayed and prayed and cried and all those things and you see nothing, no how, no interest, nothing at all. And you're like, that's an impossible situation. You've got a financial situation that you're like, man, everybody else seems to be getting blessed and everything is just going wrong for me. And I got like two weeks until they're going to foreclose on my house. What am I going to do? You've got a health situation where the doctors are saying, listen, this is the case. This is what's going to happen unless there is a miracle. And listen, am I saying I know exactly how God's going to answer your prayer? I don't. God knows. I'm saying that, yes, I know that he can, and I'm going to believe that he will. And I know that you have an enemy that wants you to quit and not believe. He wants you to believe that not only God can't do it, but that he won't do it. And yet here we got a guy in an impossible situation, and he is desperate. James calls this fervent prayer. The Puritans called this uh, prevailing prayer. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do a nothing. Now here's the truth that has to be reminded to us almost every day. Most of us do not realize how desperately we need God, even for what we call the mundane things in life. As somebody else said, it says, you don't know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. You don't know Jesus is all you really need until the bottom drops out, hell breaks loose in your home. And then it's like, I got to have God in my life. God, you got to come through. If you don't come through, it's not going to happen. Let me ask you again. What is the one significant burden right now that you're like, oh, I don't even, because some of you, some of you don't want to go there. You don't even want to open that up because it hurts. And listen, I understand that. Believe me, I understand that. We've talked about this a bunch of times. If you pray about something for a long enough time, some of y'all are just coming back to church because you know what? You prayed and you prayed and you prayed and God didn't answer the way you thought and you got mad at God. And you're like, if he's going to treat me that way, I'm out of here. I'm so grateful you're back. But just realizing this, oftentimes it's easier just to cope than it is to hope. And you prayed this thing and you prayed this thing. And after a while, you're like, you know what? I'm just going to kind of cope and I'm not going to hope anymore. And as I've said many times, God wants you to come back to hoping today, praying today, crying out. What if God says no? That's, we'll talk about that next week. But here's a challenge. Add this to your prayers. Add this to your prayer. Verse 37. In verse 37, this is like his bottom line motive. Now, does God give good gifts to his kids? Yes. Is God a good dad that sometimes he's like, you know what? I just want you to have it. You don't even need it. I just want you to have it because I love you. But underneath our prayer request needs to be verse 37 when he says, answer me that the people may know that you are God. That's a great thing to pray in this 21 days of prayer. If you've got a health issue, God, I want to pray, whether it be through a pill or a person or prayers or whatever it is, I'm going to pray for healing and then tag on so that people may know that you are God. God, I need some financial help. And the reason I'm asking it, yeah, I need to pay the rent. Yeah, I need to save my business. But so that the people may know that you are God, even in the stuff that hurts like crazy, like marriage and like prodigals, pray that. God, I pray you bring my daughter back to you. Bring my daughter back to you so that the people in her dorm and the people that have been watching this play out may know that you are that kind of God. And so you pray desperately. You pray desperately. You're like, well, what am I supposed to say? This is one of the more life-changing principles for my life, and this is the second one, and it's you pray biblically. You pray biblically. You pray. One of the, there's like several goals that I have when, we, when, we, when I get to teach y'all. Number one is that you would understand it. Number two, that you would understand how you read the Bible. So I want you to understand the Bible, but I want you to understand how you can read the Bible yourself but then number three is for you not just to read the Bible, but for you to pray the Bible back to God. They say there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 promises in the Bible, 3,000. Now, you're, some of you are like, well, yeah, but some of them are unique. Agreed, agreed. If you're a 90-year-old woman whose name happens to be Sarah, I wouldn't necessarily think it's God's will for you to have a baby. I'm just, you know, maybe, but unique promise and a unique time. Some of you are like, I wouldn't pray that anyway, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's, that's a unique one. But there are, 
There is some way, the Bible says that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Now, does that have a little mystery around it? It does, but in some way, in some Christ-centered way, every single promise is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Even in this story, the reason the drought came was out of Deuteronomy chapter 11 when he says, you get to this level of idolatry, I'm shutting down heaven. Chapter 18, it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah that the drought is over. Verse 36, I did this what? According to your word. Loved ones, pray the word back to the Lord. You're like, I don't even know how that begins. Now, let me start off by saying that varies a little bit. If you're new to the faith, if you're kicking the tires of the Christian faith, if you don't know much in here, hey, obviously, the more you know, the more you can pray back but all you've really got to do is have one of these right here. And you just put an app on your phone and look up whatever it is that is the biggest burden on your life right now. That you're like, 21 days, I'm going to pray. 21 days. If you're like, it's parenting or it's uh, habits or it's fear or it's marriage or it's whatever, just put that in there and you will get it. Just go online and go, hey, I need 20 verses on fear that I can pray back. So I'm going to give you a sampling of how this can work, but it obviously doesn't hit everybody. But it's the idea of praying it back to, praying it back to God. In other words, when you pray a verse, ask yourself the question, if I were to put this verse and pray it back to God, what would that sound like? And so an example could possibly be, so let's say you've got, uh, let's say you've got, with all the stuff going on and all the doom scrolling going on and all the fear and we got to can our vegetables and the whole thing's going down to, you know, down the tubes here pretty soon. And it's just a, and that's called fear, fear. You got a bunch of verses you could look at. There's actually 366 verses where he says, do not fear. I'm not talking about not being scared. There's a reason. Scare is an emotion. It's an emotion. Fear is a spirit. Fear is something that is like, it is just, you don't even know how to identify it. It's this general sense of fear. You're like, man, I'm just, I mean, it's saying that the the Gen Z, Gen X, and millennial, the most anxious, which is just a cousin of fear, the most anxious generation ever. What do you pray? You might take a verse like 2 Timothy 1, verse seven says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So what that, when you flip that around as a prayer, that might sound something like this. It's like, God, your word in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, you have not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so right now, I pray that you would fulfill your word in my life and that you would give me biblical courage as I walk into this business meeting, as I walk into this classroom, as I walk into this PTA meeting, as I walk into this situation, that you would give me a spirit of courage and faith as I walk in here, because you have not given me a spirit of fear. In Jesus' name, amen. You're like, well, it is what you hit. You're like, uh, what? give me a verse on marriage. Uh, There's like a hundred verses on marriage you could look up. Again, just Google it. Verses to pray about your marriage. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in God forgave you. So what does that look like? God, I'm just praying Ephesians 4.32, our house is a wreck. There's been great sin and great violation and great hurt in our life. And I pray right now you would help me to forgive my spouse for the words that were said, the deeds that were done. I want to forgive them because you have forgiven me. Help me to be kind. Help me to have a tender heart toward my spouse. You can pray that. James 1.19 says, everybody be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. So what does that look like? That means it's like, God, I'm praying a prayer right now. James 1.19 says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. And so, God, right now, I'm praying a prayer that you would help me shut my mouth, that my mouth would stay closed, that I would not say any word that would offend, that I would not say any words that would injure, that you would help close my mouth, and I would listen to what my spouse is not just saying, but what she means, And that I would understand how I can be a good husbandman and a husband in this home. Help me be the kind of person that puts the atmosphere in her home where she flourishes and does not wilt. In Jesus' name, amen. You can pray those prayers. You're like, uh, like, I I got a prodigal. I got a prodigal. And again, there's a a little book called Prayers for Prodigals, and I'm blanking out on the 
author at this point. I want to say the last name is Banks, but I could be wrong. But prayers for prodigals would be a, a great one for you to get. But what are some verses you could pray back? Uh, here's a few. Coincidentally, um, uh, John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what might that look like when you hit your knees for your prodigal? You're praying, you're like, dear God, dear God, I pray, I pray that you would show my daughter the truth. She is in captivity. She is in bondage to her sin. You had said that we will know the truth and the truth will then set us free. God, I want to pray that that day would come. I want to pray that the truth would scream into her life and she would see the error of her sin and the error of her ways. Here's one. Here's kind of a new one for, for me. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, 4 says, the sorrows of those who run after other gods shall multiply. Listen to it again. The sorrows of those who run after other gods, they will multiply. Psalm 16, 4. So what does that look like? You're praying and you're like, dear God, I want to pray for my son and I want to pray that the sin would turn like gravel into his mouth. Psalm 16, four says that the, it's the sorrows, the sorrows of those who chase after idols will multiply. You said it would happen and I pray it would happen in my prodigal that the vanity and the emptiness of the promises of fake idols would come to fruition and they would be able to turn around and see how good Jesus is. And they would see how empty the promises of the idols are. And so God help him to have the moment that the prodigal son had in Luke 15, in verse 16, when it said he had nothing, he couldn't feed himself, nobody was helping him, and yet he came to himself and he got up and he went back to his father. God, I want to pray in Jesus' name that would happen to my son, to my daughter. See what I'm saying? You just you pray it right back. Listen, five words back to God from the word are better than a hundred words that you and I feel in our spirit that we're supposed to pray. There's a bunch more. You pray for your one. Pray 1 Timothy chapter two. who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Match that up with John 6, 44. The father draws those. And so what are you praying? You're praying for your one on the wall. Sometime, as I've told you a few weeks ago, sometime when I leave, I just kind of put my hand on that, on those names. And it's like, Jesus, I, I know you've said that the Father draws them. So right now I'm praying that you would draw them to yourself. Do whatever you got to do, draw them to yourself. God, I want to pray first Timothy that it is, you said it is not your desire that any would perish. That means these four are on the wall, but they would come to the knowledge of the truth and repent. You're praying it back. Temptation, you got a temptation that's kicking your butt all over the place. You're like, what do you do then? First Corinthians 10, 13 is one. You could actually make it specific to your sin, to your strong, by the way, a sin, a habit that is kicking your butt is actually in the Bible is called a stronghold. It's a stronghold. It's actually you're thinking wrong about it. And the reason you're thinking wrong about it is because you've actually not repented from it, all right? Repentance doesn't mean I'm never gonna go there again. It means I hate the kind of person that I've become to like that, that I've become a rebel against the God who loves me. And so I'm gonna think differently about it, but maybe part that you might think is pray 1 Corinthians 10, 13 over that temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken me, but that which is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a means of escape. So what does that look like? When you're on that business trip, and nobody's there, no accountability. And you pray, God, I tell you what, I've fallen into this temptation a hundred times. But by God's grace, the Bible says you are faithful and you will provide a means of escape. So right now, on my knees, I'm praying that you would tangibly show me the means of escape, a buddy to call, something to do, some kind of, I don't want this to happen, please show me the way of escape. And the Bible says you are faithful in Jesus' name, amen. You know what? The Bible says he will show you the means of escape could be your kids, not prodigal, just kids. Pray Psalm 127. It's like, you know what? They're like arrows. You're like, you hit your knees like, God, I pray you'd help, you'd help us to shoot these arrows in the right direction. And if they're going off in the wrong direction, God, that you would just bring a strong wind and blow them back in the direction you want them to, blow, to go in. Some of you got shame. I mean, every time you're always struggling. I can't, I just can't get, can't take one step forward with God because every time I take one step forward with God, my enemy reminds me of all of my past and I just get, I just get bogged down in that. And so you need to be able to pray. 
There's a bunch of verses you could pray, but Romans 8, 1, we talk about just there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So I'm praying right now, God, I'm praying that the reality of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there's no condemnation. I'm in Christ Jesus, and you do not condemn me. You do not deem me unfit for use. I am not condemned. I'm not condemned because I'm in Christ Jesus. And I'm praying that back to you, help it to become a reality in me. See what I'm saying? You pray, you pray that back. You pray the word, you pray the word back, which um, essentially I came across this one. I should have said this during the prodigal time, but um, Ruth Graham Bell, or Ruth Graham, in her book, Prodigals and Those Who Love Them, tells the story of waking up in the middle of the night and she's worried for one of her kids. And the kid was Franklin, actually, because they had, I think, several prodigals there, but that's the oldest son. He was running from God, running hard from God. And here's what she says. She says, it was around three o'clock. The name of someone I loved dearly flashed into my mind. It was like an electric shock. Instantly, I was wide awake. I knew there would be no more sleep for me the rest of the night. So I lay there and I prayed for the one who was trying hard to run from God. When it was dark and the imagination runs wild, there are fears only a mother can understand. And then suddenly the Lord said to me, quit studying the problems and start studying the promises. Loved one, that's what, that's what Elijah's doing. He knew the promises. He's praying those back to God. And for you and I, you take that burden and you find a promise. And for 21 days, you pray that back to God. You're like, what would happen? Well, here's what happens in the story. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. I didn't know fire could consume dust. And licked up the water that was in the trench. That Ephesians 3 passage about how God will do immeasurably more than you can even think or imagine. That's kind of what it's like here. He doesn't just like, here's a little fire, here's a little spark. And, and now he's just like, boom, he just comes down. Everything, I mean, it's like over the top. It's kind of like God's, it's not that God's showing off, but he is showing out right here. And he's like, up. A fire from heaven, that's the biggest request you got? Boom, it's done. And it's awesome when prayers are answered like that. It is awesome, and that is the way it happens sometimes. Sometimes you pray, you get up off your knees, boom, the uh, answer is there. I remember the, one of the first mission trips I ever went on, that's what happened. I went with the basketball team over to Africa, and it was one of the first long mission trips I'd been on. I think I lacked a couple of thousand dollars and I was like, uh, God, would you please, would you please, God, I got a couple thousand dollars. I need a couple thousand dollars for this mission trip. And there's like two days left or something like that. So I'm praying, I'm in Electra, Texas and I'm praying that prayer. I don't have $2,000 to self fund. I get up off my knees. It'd probably been three minutes. My older brother calls and goes, hey, God just kind of laid it on my heart to help you out with this mission trip. And Karen and I were talking and we thought maybe $2,000 would help. I was like, yes, it would help a lot. Yes, it would. Sometimes that's the way prayer goes. Sometimes it takes longer. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God the Lord, he is God. Which, by the way, this is another example of why the object of your faith is much more important than the strength of your faith. You hear a lot of preachers like, you know what? You just have faith in faith. If you have enough faith, then God's obligated to answer. And the Bible does not teach faith in faith. The Bible teaches faith in God. The Bible teaches faith in God's word and God's character. That's what it's not. It's not about how much faith you can, as a matter of fact, the Bible actually, Jesus says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, tiny little seed, you will say to that mountain, go from here and there. Now he's not talking about, okay, take grandfather mountain and move it. A mountain in the Bible was often something that if you looked at it, you're like, that's been there a long time, no changing. It's intimidating. That's what it is. He's like, you know what? You, you have mustard sized faith in a great God then that great God can take stuff that has been the same way for decades and change it. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah took them to the train station. Sorry, that was just a Yellowstone version. Then Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing rain. Now, we don't really know what he's hearing or if this is just faith. We don't know if he hears thunder or what. I don't think he does because of what you're about to read. 
So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel. Now listen, look at this verse, and I'm, I'm going to tell you two ways you can look at this verse, and I'm not sure which one exactly. The principle's the same. I'm not sure exactly which one is he trying to communicate, but he bowed himself down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees. I think the principle's pretty obvious, is when we pray with power, the prayers are done, in a very, done humbly. So most commentators and most theologians would say, okay, this is just a sign kind of like you would get on your knees. It's kind of like here in a little while, people are going to be on this carpet or in the deal and you're going to be, you're going to be on your knees. And anytime you see something like this, that is a picture of humility. And that's so appropriate. I mean, the promises about humility are all over the Bible. First Peter chapter five, it's like, listen, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you at the proper time. And how do you do that? Next verse, cast all your anxiety upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. So he actually is saying, humble yourself before God. What does that look like? You cast all that stuff, your most significant burden on the Lord. But a number of people made the interesting observation that it's not just saying he kneels. I'm not limber enough to do this move Elijah did. He must've been a young buck because, you know, took him, taking Pilates or whatever because he actually sits down and it's a picture. I'm just telling you. He's like, look at what it says. Just reading the Bible. It's like he sits down and he puts his, he puts his head between his knees. They're like, you know what that is a picture of? That is a picture they say, that's a picture of a woman in labor. It's a picture of a woman in labor, kind of like in the fetal position. And I thought that, that might be what's going on because what you're about to see is sometimes, and this is where it's hard to talk about. Sometimes when you are praying for the most significant burden in your life, it can be both long and it can be both long and painful. There can be hours and days and decades, which I, by the way, I looked it up. The longest labor in history is 75 days. Polish woman, 75 days, good on her. I know a lot of guys will say, oh, I had a kidney stone. That's just like, that's just like labor. And all the ladies said, no, yeah, don't, don't say what you're actually thinking. All right, so I think if, if you're a mom, if you've had a child, you understand, I remember a, Tyler's, uh, our first son, it was a, it was a difficult labor because his, I think the, the back of his skull like got caught on Lori's tailbone. And so he was stuck. And so they didn't know it for a while. So the labor went on and on and on. Now, let me just say this. I'm not amazingly sensitive, but I took it that when my wife said, baby, this is going to be a long time. Why don't you go get something to eat? I thought what she meant was, baby, this labor is going to be a long time. Why don't you go get something to eat? That's what I thought she meant. And so I went to Whataburger and came back with a double with cheese and was eating it as she's in labor. Now, I've never seen my wife's head spin around three times until that moment. And it spun around three times. And I saw, look, I pray to the Lord I never see again. But the labor was long, it was difficult, but when it was over, it was so amazingly worth it, so much so, after all of that travail, it wasn't a week later, she was like, hey, this is amazing, let's have another baby, we gotta have another, I was like, hey, because the joy of the delivery of the boy took all the pain and all the anguish, and yeah, even the time and just took it all away. Now what we're praying for, that is in the next 21 days, some of you who have been praying for a long time would see the answer to those prayers and the pain and the length in which you have prayed. And we would see those and would say, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth it, it is, it is worth it. And so, because sometimes that is, sometimes you pray, fire comes down, boom, immediate. Sometimes you pray, and it takes a while, and you see both in this story, and we'll talk next week about sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's slow, which is kind of the hard, difficult part, but check out verse 43. 
And he says, he is Elijah. He says to his servant, go up now. I love this. Go up now. Look toward the sea. So the storms and the rain would come from. Look toward the sea. And he went and he looked and he said, there is nothing. Now listen to me. It would be so easy for Elijah with just being able to see with fleshly eyes, with no spiritual insight to just be so depressed at this point. And think about what he's just done. He's just told Ahab, go back, there's rain coming. He just took 450 prophets to the train station, but Jezebel's still alive. Jezebel's still alive and she's killed a bunch of the other, the good prophets. He sends his servant to go look for where the rain typically comes from. The servant comes back and says, boss, nothing. Clear blue sky, nothing on the horizon, no rain, no clouds, nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. God, this, this is, go again seven times. Now, loved ones, we don't even know how long is in between those seven. I mean, was it a day? Was it an hour? Was it a minute? Did he come back, send him right back? I mean, think about this. Think about the time he had to go back up on the mountain, and then he had to come back down. Then he had to come back up, give him bad news. Go back up, come back. I mean, some of you all have prayed for something, and you just get bad news after bad news, and that's Elijah six times. Six times the guy comes back, boss, he got nothing. But the seventh time. Seventh time. And by the way, let me say this. Most, most of the teaching of prayer by Jesus Think about it this, I didn't really realize this until like three months ago. Most of the teaching that Jesus taught on prayer was about persistence and not giving up. I mean, think about that. I mean, most of the, the parables that he, like they would say, Lord, teach us to pray. And then he would tell a story, He'd tell a story about a neighbor who comes in the middle of the night, all the family's asleep and he keeps knocking and keeps knocking. And it says basically because of the persistence of that neighbor, he gets up and he feeds the guests. Or the one that's crazy, crazy, is a few chapters later in Luke 18 when this widow and this unjust judge, and the unjust judge was acting like an unjust judge, and she kept basically pestering him, and finally the judge is like, this lady's gonna drive me crazy if I don't give her justice. And it's not that God is the unjust judge. Jesus says, listen, if an unjust judge would actually eventually give what she needed, how much more a God who loves you will give you what you need? But somewhere in there, it is persistence. And so this last one, we just, I'm going to just say pray when we pray over the next 21 days. Pray expectantly. One of the Psalms, I'm blanking out on what it is. I meant to write it down. It says, early in the morning, you will hear my voice, and then I will get up and I will watch. I love that. Early in the morning, you'll hear my voice. So he gets up and he prays. And then he gets, and the idea is then he watches for seeing how that prayer is going to be answered. Verse 44 says, and at the seventh time, he said, I look, look at this. Some of y'all, what you're gonna see in the next 21 days is not a full answer to your prayer, but you're gonna see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Because he says it, behold, a little cloud, like a man's hand is rising from the sea. Now again, how easy, when you have started to cope and cease to hope, and you see a cloud the size of a man's hand, the tendency is to go, Psh, Man, that is nothing. Coincidence is what that is. But when you see with eyes of faith, you're like, boom, that is it. That is the beginning of a shower. Then he says, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising up from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. In other words, listen, this is gonna rain so hard you can have a four wheel drive and you are still gonna get bogged down. That's how much rain we're gonna have. And here's the way the story ends. And in a little while, while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Jezreel's about 15 miles away. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. If you're like, what, what do you wanna pray for people? Pray that. The hand of the Lord, it's that, it's, it's talked about a number of different ways. The hand of the Lord is just that, you know, kind of that, it's that anointing, that, the fact that God's hand and his presence and it's obvious that stuff is happening that you can't manufacture. That's the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment 
And this is awesome. He gathered up his, so he's got this robe. And so he takes his robe and he's like, he, he tucks it in his belt. I mean, he, listen, he doesn't have good shoes. He doesn't have Lululemon joggers. He doesn't have any of this stuff at all. He's got, he's got the worst possible equipment. And he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So in other words, this guy on foot somehow beats this chariot 15 miles to where they were going. You're like, what's the point? Honestly, I don't know what the point is, but what the Lord showed me was, and he showed me about a hundred times, is he can do more in like five seconds with his hand. In five seconds, he can do more than I can do in five years without him. Five years, work and toil and hope and sweat and then boom, in five seconds, just boop, God does something and it's so much more effective. You're like, well, how do I pray in a faithful way? We I talked to you about this in Psalms, I believe. You're like, I don't know how to pray about this situation. Now, is God telling me yes? Is he telling me no? Is he, well, again, we'll talk about it next week, but probably the, the most faithful way we can pray over the next 21 days is like those three guys in the fiery furnace from the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar comes up and it's like, if you don't bow down to my idol, I'm gonna throw you in the fire. And it's like, listen, you do what you want, but we're not gonna bow down. So he throws him in the fire, actually turns the fire up. And basically what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego basically say is this, God, you know what? God, I, I believe, I, I, know you can, I know you can rescue us. I know you can, and I believe you will. And even if you don't, I'm not gonna bow down to the idol of fear. That's a sovereign God kind of way to pray. So over the next 21 days, that's a great way to pray. God, I, I know you can. I know you can bring our marriage back together. I know you can bring the prodigal back home. I know you can heal me in an instant. I know you can. And I actually believe you will. I believe you will. Unless God has told you to stop praying for something, keep praying. And then, even if you don't, I'm not gonna bow down to fear. So there's a song that talks about, I'm gonna fight on my knees. I'm gonna fight on my knees. So that's what the next 21 days is about. When we fight, we're gonna fight on our knees. Because you gotta remember, I mean, what prayer is. Prayer is not, this kind of prayer is not like, I think it's Piper that says, prayer is like wartime walkie-talkie. It's not like baby monitor, ooh, let's be nice and quiet. It's like walkie-talkie calling in air support for a situation that is dire. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for 21 days. After we get done today, I encourage you to go ahead and get the resources, get an accountability buddy. Why don't you stand to your feet and I'm gonna pray and we're gonna respond. Lord, we love you. I, we love you a ton. We wanna love you more. God, I pray that the next three or four minutes would be a precursor, would be a token, would be a picture of the next 21 days. God, you tell us in James, we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, we ask with the wrong motives. So our motives, we want our motives to be what Elijah was, that the people would know that you are God. God, I pray that thousands of us would go from coping with that burden to hoping again, to hope. And you know what? I am going to see that. We want to claim the promises you, you've made. We want to claim Psalm 27, 13. I would have despaired if I did not believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so our prayer is right now that we would do battle on our knees, that we would pray for our one, for our marriages, for our prodigal, for our children, for our community. We love you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray it in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.